Again, to the word of the Lord, as I told folks in the first service, God was so good. It's been so extremely busy. We've been, we've had early hours and very late hours. Um, and I knew two weeks ago that Pastor Renee would be gone this Sunday, and I knew that it would be so busy coming up to this, and so I was preparing the message and praying, and the Lord really helped me two weeks ago, which never happens, you know, that never happens. And then I spent time yesterday finishing, but we're going to continue this morning. Uh, the Holy Spirit and our salvation, and um, we'll keep on going. I think this morning is the last morning of this series, but we're going to be talking more about the Holy Spirit in the future. God, the Holy Spirit. Not weird. He's God. Not strange. He's God. He, in, in nature and character, He's like Jesus. He is, Jesus said, I'm, another one is going to come like me, another one like me. And so we've been talking about for the last two times the Holy Spirit and our salvation. We're going to finish that up this morning. I have a question for you this morning. Do you remember when you were saved? The exact time when you were saved. Do you remember? Some of us may not. I was very young. Um, and I don't remember the date, but I know how old I was, and I remember the, clearly it was the evening, and I've told, told some of you before. I was thinking about this yesterday as I, was, as, I was, uh, as I was preparing, and I was thinking about the word saved, because that's a very religious word, isn't it? It's kind of religious talk. Have you ever talked with someone who is not a Christian at all, and who is not part of church and maybe doesn't even have much church background. Maybe they have a religious back, uh, a traditional religious background. And you talk about being saved and they look at you, saved, what do you mean? You, you were, you know, somebody was going to get you, somebody, whatever. And I was thinking about that yesterday because sometimes as Christians we use words that people who are not Christians and not part of church, they don't always they don't always understand what we're talking about. And as I've grown and gone on in the Lord, I'm mostly talking with Christians in church, but I've tried more and more, God help me to, how can I talk about you? How can I share you with people that don't know you, that it won't turn them off and they'll understand what I'm talking about. So I was thinking about this word, word saved yesterday. Why do we use it in church? Why do, we, why do we use the word saved, this expression, to describe our experience when our lives are transformed, when we are brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, as, as, we, as we sang and as Stephen uh, uh, prayed this morning, and when our lives come from our old lives to our new lives. Well, first of all, we use this expression because God the Holy Spirit inspired it in the Word of God. That's what's used in God's Word. Why does God inspire? Why did he inspire the expression, I'm saved, or salvation? Think about this for just a minute. Think about the time before you were a Christian. Whether you felt it or not, you were a sinner and you were condemned. You were before you became Christian. You may not have felt it. How many of you, before you became a Christian, for much of your non-Christian life, you didn't feel condemned at all. You were just living your life like everybody else was living their lives, right? No condemnation, no. I mean, sometimes you did some bad things that you shouldn't have done, and you said, I'm going to do better, I'm not going to do that anymore. But you didn't really feel condemned, did you? And, and that's how that describes many, many people. And then the Holy Spirit started working, and then at some point you felt condemned, didn't you? And, and condemned you were, and condemned I was. Why? Because the Bible says we were sinners, and we are under condemnation. We're under condemnation because of sin. And so, whether we felt it or not, we were under condemnation for our sins. We were going to have to pay for our sins, whether we knew it or not. And I want to say this as we're looking at this this morning. This morning, if you are here, and you are not yet a Christian, you're not yet saved. You may have been in church a long time. Your family may be Christian. You may be, who knows? But if you have not yet begun a relationship with God, a real relationship with God, then this morning you are condemned. That's not very politically correct. Well, I don't like that. But I'm telling you, this is what God says. We're, you are condemned because of sins. And because of sins, 
you have a price to pay and you have a judgment. So because of sin, you think of all the movies that you see. The, uh, the uh, uh, convicted person, so the condemned person, the convicted person stands up in court. How do you plead? I plead not guilty, Your Honor. How many people stand in front of a judge and say, guilty, Your Honor? Nobody does that. They stand in front of the judge and they say, not guilty, Your Honor. And a lot of us have felt not guilty. Not guilty, not guilty, Your Honor. But in fact, the Bible says very clearly, because of the condemnation of our sins, our judgment is guilty. Our judgment is guilty. Whether we feel it or not, whether we want it or not, whether we like it or not, our judgment is we're guilty. What are we going to do about the judgment of guilt? When there's a judgment of guilt, then there is a sentencing for the guilt. What is the sentence for guilt of sin? What is it? Five years? Life? No. Death. Death is the sentence for the judgment of sin. So we, when that describes us, that's why we're not saved. That's why we're in trouble. And some of us this morning, if you have not yet come to this place in relationship with Jesus, this describes you this morning, whatever your age, whatever your age. This describes you if you've not yet begun a relationship with God. Here's the good news that you know already. Here's the good news. There is someone who came and who said, you're a sinner, but I'll take your sins. You've been judged guilty, but I'll take your guilt. You've got to pay for it with your death, but I'm going to pay for it with my death. And his name was Jesus. His name was Jesus. And when he did that for you and me at Calvary, and we received that in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit, we were what? Saved. We were saved. We were saved. And that's, why we, that's also why we use the word saved. Now the Holy Spirit it was at work in that, but I want us to look at John 3, 17 and 18. All of us have memorized John 3, 16, right? Can you quote it this morning? I, I always quote King James because that's what my parent, you know, dad spoke. He spoke the King James. Um, in whatever version you know it, let's quote John 3, 16. But then I want us to look at John 3, 17 and 18 because this is a wonderful part of the whole passage. For God, together please, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise the Lord. And then it is said, God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world. That is not why Jesus came. So all that I just said to you, you say, well, wow, that's a, that's a downer. That's hard. That's not the point of all of that. The point of all of that is that Jesus came into the world not to judge, but to save the world through him. In the first part of verse 18, there's no judgment against anyone who believes in him. Now the Holy Spirit was at work in your salvation when you came to this point. This part doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit, but we've been looking at the verses that do talk about that. And the Holy Spirit, remember what He does? Jesus went to Calvary for you and for me. He did everything that needed to be done at Calvary. But then when we come to salvation, the Holy Spirit, and it's through faith and through things we don't completely understand, says Jesus, because it's like the, whole, the wind, and how do you explain that? And then at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes what Jesus did on the cross and applies it to your life and to my life, and everything is changed. Everything is different after that. And that's what we've been looking at. And that's what we're, these last two weeks, and we're going to continue looking at this morning. And the Holy Spirit is at work in part of that. So I ask you this morning, are you saved? Do you remember when you were saved? Yes. I hope so. Anyhow, back then. But Peter says something a little bit different. You were saved, but Peter says, and it's written in his letter, 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, Though you have not seen him, you love him. This is kind of great. 
because Peter had seen Jesus. And he's writing to people who have never seen Jesus. In another place it says, Blessed are you because you've, you, you, have, you believe. But even, even more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe and still believe. That describes you this morning. That describes me this morning. And Peter's talking to people that haven't seen Jesus. And he says, even though you've not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Inexpressible, inexpressible, the original, the word means in Greek, higher than speech or above speech. There's no way to use speech to describe this. Why are we filled with inexpressible and glorious joy? Verse 9, for you are what? Receiving, uh, next slide, Okay, here we go. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Why are we filled with joy? We are receiving the goal of your faith. Now those of us that um, study the English, uh, or that have been English teachers in the past, we look at that and that tells us something a little bit different. Are we saved? Have we been saved in the past? Yes. But what does this say? We are in the process of receiving the goal of our faith which is the salvation of our souls. And if you'll read through the New Testament, and those of you that have been part of the teaching before that, I've ha that we've, t we've had on 1 Peter, this tells us that salvation, were you saved? Yes, you were. Are you being saved? Yes, you are. And there is a process of salvation, and there is a complete and a full salvation that is yet ahead. Now, before you get all upset and say, I'm not saved, I'm only 50%, you're saved. You're saved. You're a Christian. You're going to heaven. But is there still a salvation process in your life as the Holy Spirit works? Yes, there is. He is still working in your life and He's still working in my, my life. And is there yet a future salvation? Yes, there is. And we'll look at some verses in a little bit that talk about that. When is our salvation complete? When is our salvation complete? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we didn't, I didn't put the verses up, you can read it later, it talks about that great day when Jesus comes. The dead in Christ will rise first, 1 Thessalonians 4, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is the point of your complete salvation. That's the point of complete redemption. You say, are you sure about that? I'm sure about that. Are you sure? I'm sure about that. And at that moment, we will be fully complete and restored in the image of God in the way that He planned for us to be from the beginning in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve lost what God had given through their disobedience and the choice they had made. At the moment of our complete redemption. It will all be restored. Praise the Lord. We will be saved spirit, soul, and body. Are you saved right now? Yes. Tell me about your bodies this morning. Tell me about your bodies. Well, I can tell that your bodies are not yet fully redeemed. Do you know how I know that? Because you're wearing glasses this morning. <laughs> Did you know that? That is a sign that your body is not yet fully redeemed. What happened when you got up this morning, some of you? A little bit of ache here, a little bit of pain here, a little bit of whatever here. Our bodies are still bound by, this, by the laws, these physical laws, and they're dying. They're dying. That's why the Bible says the last enemy to be defeated is what? Death. Death. And when Jesus comes again, that coming when he comes to earth, open for all to see, not the rapture, but when he comes again, you and I will be fully redeemed. You say, but what if I've gone on to heaven before then? Still at that point, the dead in Christ, at that point, you and I, the re full redemption work will be done at that point. And that's future. That's future. So we have been saved. That was a quick short theology of a very complicated subject. We'll come back to it at another time. We have been saved. We're being saved. We will be completely saved. And the Holy Spirit 
is at work in every part of it. God the Holy Spirit is at work in every part of it. This says, this word receiving is again a technical word, a legal word that means to obtain something that is due to a person. To receive something, to get something that is due. And when faith is in your heart and you believe in Jesus, it is due you. It will be due you. And God keeps his promise. God pays all debts. He does. And this, you are receiving the goal of your faith, the full salvation. The full salvation. And that is yet ahead. The Holy Spirit's working in every part. It is his responsibility to convict you of sin, to convict you of, I'm condemned. I have to pay for my sin. And, and if I don't receive Jesus, I pay for it. And he brings you to that point where you say, Jesus, I receive what you've done for me on Calvary. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Holy Spirit is at work. And he gives us life. So we look at the Holy Spirit's work at salvation. The next slide. His, his work at salvation, he gives us life. What is that life? It's the spiritual life that Adam and Eve lost in the garden. The spiritual life. Again, you and I can have a relationship with God. Until that happens, listen, brothers and sisters, you may, be, you may be a sinner, you may not yet have a relationship with God, and you can pray to Him, and He hears you, and He will answer, but until the Holy Spirit gives you new life, you cannot have that relationship with God. That only comes when a person has been born again, and then a relationship with God begins. Jesus said, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So religion is not enough. Church is not enough. I know you get tired of hearing me say this, but I say it again anyhow, because we need to remember that. Our good deeds, they're not enough. Our, our, I try to be the best I can be. It's not enough. It's not enough. Only the Holy Spirit, through the work of Jesus on the cross, gives new birth and gives new life. That's the only way. And He is at work. He restores. What else does He do? What else does He do? So He gives us new life. Second, He changes our citizenship. We talked about this some last time. And the Phillips translation says, we must never forget. He rescued us. Aha, uh -huh, we've been saved. From the kingdom and power of darkness. Reestablished us in the kingdom of his beloved son. That is in the kingdom of light. I talked about it in the first service and I couldn't remember the exact reference and then we found it. I love the verse, I love from the, from the letter to the Philippians that Paul, uh, that Paul writes about in, in chapter 3. And he talks about Christian, people that are supposed to be Christians. He says, their this is in verse 19, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Listen, he's talking about church folks there. He's not talking about the world. But look at what else he says. Their and he says, their mind is on earthly things. The Phillips translation says, and I like it so much, it says, this world is the limit of their horizon. I want to ask you something this morning, if you are a Christian. What is the limit of your horizon? Are your thoughts, are your affections, is your time, are your relationships tied up only in the things of this world that will not last, that will perish? Are your pleasures coming only from, oh, there's this party or there's that, or doing this or that, that is part of this world and that will perish? If so, this world is the limit of your horizon. And you are forgetting that he has brought you out of that and he's given you new citizenship. It says in verse 20, their mind, uh, verse 19, their mind is on earthly things. Verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there. Because saved, right? We await a Savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hey, now remember what I told you before? We are saved, we're being saved, and we're going to be fully saved. This tells us more about it. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, here we go, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. That's complete salvation. That's complete redemption. We are citizens. We are citizens of heaven. And we have new relationships, new rules. And the Holy Spirit does this. He changes our citizenship. What else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit, next slide, he brings us into this side, he brings us into the body of Christ. We read these verses, and we looked at this last week. This does not seem very radical, does it? We've read this a lot. Does this sound very radical to you? Ah. We're so used to reading it, we're so used to, we don't really think about it. These words at the time that Paul wrote them would have, it turned society upside down because there were deep divisions, there were deep differences. I'm better than you, you're better than I am. Oh no, I wouldn't dare to whatever. Do you know that in those days, in many situations, a slave did not wear shoes? In, 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 the, in the culture. He did not wear shoes and that showed you are not a free man. You're a slave. You're a slave. And, and that, showed, that showed his status in society. He didn't, there was always, there, there was a distinction. All of these things. And Paul writes and he says, you are brought into the family of God and when you do all of these differences, God does not see these differences. God does not see these separations. You know, I, I live here in Hong Kong and I see sometimes some of the divisions and some of the things and, and some of us see it and some of us feel it and some of us may not, may not so much, but sometimes it's really great to have white skin here and sometimes it's really bad to have white skin here. Just depending on who I'm around or whatever. Uh, Generally speaking, it's not great to have black skin here, is it, Stephen? Nope, not really. Not really. But you know what? God doesn't see those things. God doesn't see those things. And He doesn't see those things because the Holy Spirit has done a work. He has baptized us into one body by one Spirit. And baptize means what? Not water baptize, not water baptize. It's a spiritual thing, so we don't know exactly. It's, it's something that is, it's a spiritual thing inside, but baptism talks about death, doesn't it? When we are water baptized, what does it mean? Death to sin, new life. When we are spirit baptized, death to self, death to self and alive to God. And he uses the terminology baptized because there, it helps us to understand those things, those divisions, that's dead, that's gone, that's over with. You're now in the family of God. And brothers and sisters, because God, the Holy Spirit, worked and brought us into his family without those divisions, he wants us and he works in our hearts and our lives so that we also do not keep these things in our heart, in our thoughts, in our way of thinking. This morning, if you have something against somebody, you are grieving the Holy Spirit who baptized you and brought you into the family of God. Go and take care of it. Make it right. And if you say, well, it's not me. The other person did it. Oh. That may be, but you know what you can do? You can pray for them, and then you can go to them to make it easy to restore a harmonious relationship. You can do that. You say, no, I don't want to do that. Hey, Jesus did it for us. He did it for us. Can we not do it for others in a much easier way than Jesus did? Sure we can. Sure we can. So there's this relationship this way, but that's not the only relationship when we're brought into the family of God. There's also the vertical relationship because that's part of being in the family. And here is this that the, that the Holy Spirit also does. We look at Romans 8, 15 through 16. He says, Paul writes and he says, You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Oh, you know, those slaves that don't get to wear shoes as they walk through the streets. Instead, you received God's Spirit. What type of Spirit did you receive? God's Spirit. DNA from God. DNA from God. When He adopted you as His own children. And now we call Him what? Abba. Father. What does Abba Father mean? 
that's an Aramaic, Abba, that's an Aramaic word. What does Abba Father mean? We, some of us know very well. Somebody give, give us a translation for Abba Father. Daddy. Well, now that's fine, but that's because we're American and we say daddy. But there are a lot of non-Americans here. So, for a familiar term for father that shows close relationship, what else might you say? If you are Chinese, you, would, you wouldn't say, uh, well, Fu Qin, my father. That's very, very formal. What would you say, Lily? What? Lo Dao. Oh, I don't know that. Lo Dao. Hai mai. Hai gam hai mai. Lo Dao. Okay. Okay. Or if you're from the mainland, you'd say Baba, right? You'd say Baba. And Sebastian, guess what? That's the same thing that you say in Togo, right? Baba. What do you say in Uganda, Stephen? Baba. Uh, in Tagalog or another? Pai Pai. Pai Pai. Any other, any other things that you might say? Papa. Okay. Papa. All of these things, that helps us to understand what Paul is writing about here. When you have a close relationship and a good relationship with your father, do you go to them and say, Oh, father, good morning. <laughs> unlikely, unlikely. And God the Holy Spirit works to show us and to bring us into this really close, a loving relationship. That's what he does. That's what the Spirit of God does in our hearts. And then look at the next verse, and this will lead us into what comes next. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm, affirm, and that's a strong word, to affirm that we are God's children. The Holy Spirit works in your heart and in your life. Do you ever feel... Um, you, you lack confidence or you doubt, am I really a child of God? Do I really belong to Him? Am I really a Christian? I've, I've failed. I don't this. How many of you have ever not felt like a Christian? You've just not felt like a Christian. I've got two hands up. Sometimes I just don't feel, I don't feel like it. But the Holy Spirit keeps working in our hearts and in our lives. And He works to affirm you are God's child. That's His work. That's His work. That's what He does. And His Spirit joins with our spirit. And it's an affirmation. You belong to God. You belong to God. You belong to God. Amen. Amen. Now, what else does He do? And this brings us into what comes next. This was our homework a couple of weeks ago. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit identifies you as belonging to God. You belong to to him. What does it say? You also were included in Christ. He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth. That's the Holy Spirit's work at salvation. Remember when you prayed and you said, oh God, have mercy on me, forgive me, come into my heart, I give you my life. At that moment, he identified you as belonging to God. When you heard the word of truth, you were included in Christ, who was part of the family, right? It's all of this. It's these separate things and then it fits together as well. That's what the Holy Spirit does. You became a Christian. He identifies you as belonging to Him. I have met baby Christians. They don't even know Genesis is the first book of the Bible. They don't even know Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit is in them. They belong to God. They belong to God. You may have things in your life that still need to be worked out, but the Holy Spirit in you affirms you belong to God. He identifies you belong to God. That is His work. When the enemy comes and attacks you and says, you're so bad, how could God still love you? You blew it again again. The Holy Spirit affirms you are God's child. And because you are His child, you can, 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins and He's faithful and just to forgive your sins. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Okay, what else does He do? Let's look at the next part. And we come to this part. He seals you. He seals you. So here's this first part. And then, having believed, you are marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Where is this seal? 
Where is this seal? It's a spiritual seal. He uses human terminology to help us understand. Here we go. Okay. And this is what would have been done. This was very often done in the early world. And there would have been hot wax of some sort. And there would have been a seal. And that would have gone down. And it meant something. So you were sealed. If you're Chinese today, then you know very, very well that you have a what? Chop. Red ink and a chop. And it's a seal. And it's very permanent. And it means something. It means something as well. A king often would have a signet ring or a seal ring. And he would mark it. And that meant it was official. And so the Holy Spirit seals us. He seals us. Now how does he seal us? And what does this mean? First of all, it means the work is done. So you're saved. Is there, is there still a, a, an ongoing salvation and a future complete salvation? Yes. But the seal is there to say, it's done. You're saved. You're his. So that's part of it. It means it's official. When you have a legal document, what happens? We, we know that so well in Hong Kong, right? If there's no seal, it's, that's, it's not finished yet. It's not complete. It's not legal yet. So the seal means it's legal and it's done. That means when the Holy Spirit does that, you belong to God. You're His. You're His. What else? Remember when Jesus was buried, He was put in the tomb, and they rolled the stone across, and then they put the seal on the stone? And what did that mean? That meant this is, it meant a protection, it meant a guard, okay? That's what it meant. Guess what? It means the same thing for you and for me. It's a mark of authenticity, and this is what the Holy Spirit does in your life and in my life. He is a seal. He's a seal. He's a guarantee. Okay, now what comes next? Let's go to the next part. So I l love this part. Let's look at this in verse 14. So there's this, there's this. The Holy Spirit is doing all of this. And then we read in verse 14, the promised Holy Spirit. Who promised the Holy Spirit? Who promised? Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. He was also promised in the Old Testament. The promised Holy Spirit, verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Ah, now this is what I talked about earlier. Until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Now, I want us to see something here that's so meaningful for us this morning. The Holy Spirit who is a deposit. Who makes the... Where is the deposit? First of all, let me ask you that. Where is the deposit? Where is it? Is it in my Bible? Where is it, Keith? It's in us. It's in us. It's on us. It's on our lives. So the deposit is in us. Who or what is the deposit? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Who makes the deposit? Who makes the deposit? Jesus or God makes the deposit. God makes the deposit in you. Brothers and sisters, get the picture this morning and hold on to this truth. When you become a Christian, God makes a deposit in your life and in my life by giving us the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit, it, He is God and He comes from God. And it is deposited in our life. Now what does that deposit mean? What does that deposit do? That deposit guarantees you are His. The devil can't snatch you out. You can't, he's not, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to grab him out of God's hand. The Bible is very, very clear about that. Now, there are all sorts of things about once saved, always saved, eternal security. I, I don't, don't want to get into that this morning. But what I know is this. When God seals you with his Holy Spirit and puts his deposit, and you also say, God, I want you, and you keep on saying, God, I want you, that takes care of it. That takes care of it. That settles it. And you can rest secure in that. You can rest secure. I meet Christians all the time who are so afraid. Maybe I can't make it. I'm going to, maybe I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to whatever. Listen, he has put his deposit. God did this. God did this in you, on you, upon you. And it's a powerful deposit. It's a powerful deposit. And all you have to do, you keep saying yes to God. That's it. You keep saying yes to God. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. I remember one time, I was in the fifth grade. I was already Christian by then. I was in the fifth grade. And some, you know, you know fifth graders. 
and I had a teacher and uh, I said something about being a Christian. I was going to go to heaven. And I still remember my teacher. She looked at me and she said, you don't know that. You can't say that. You, you, you don't have any guarantee of that. And I didn't have all the theology at that point, you know. But the, I remember the teacher said that to me. You, you, you can't say that. And I looked at her and I said, yes, I can. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to heaven. No, you can't. And she never convinced me. And I don't know if I convinced her or not. But I, I knew I'll make it. I knew the Holy Spirit was in me. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is God's deposit in you guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's uh, possession. He is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Remember what I said earlier? We have been saved. We are being saved. And we will be saved. What is our inheritance? I love this. What is our inheritance? Heaven. But if you say heaven, that's that's part of it, but that's not all of it. Listen. Everything. Oh, beloved. Everything in this word. Every promise that God makes to you. Everything he says about himself and his love for you. Everything that is written here about the glory that is yet to be revealed. Every promise, every word that God says about heaven, about redemption, about healing, about all of these things, the inheritance that is yours and is mine. This is what it says, guaranteeing our inheritance. If it's inher an inheritance, some of it we don't get. Now, inheritance is yet ahead. How many of you have ever counted on an inheritance and it fell through? You thought you were going to get it? didn't get it. That's happened in my family several times. And my parents, it was on both sides, and my parents said, and it was very disappointing as we went through some very difficult things, and my parents sat down and they said, God is our inheritance. That's what they decided. God's our inheritance. And brothers and sisters, God is your inheritance and all of this all of this, it is ours. And God is going to keep you and me until the time of full redemption. And it is all ours. Do we get part of it now? Yes, we get part of it now. Let me ask you, I want you to think for a minute, in your Christian life, the times of greatest blessing. Can, can you think about some times when there was just an overwhelming love in your heart or an overwhelming sense of the glory of God. I remember years ago, Panina still remembers it, we talk about it, we were out in, in, out in the, somewhere near Gold Coast. I don't know, Stephen, I don't know if you remember that or not. And it was, we were having like a, a mini camp and we were praising the Lord, we were singing, we were praising the Lord. And to this day, I still get chill bumps when I think about it. I remember it wasn't anything particularly special that was going on, but it was suddenly, we were in a room that was not very large, it, it was suddenly as if, it was suddenly as if the roof, the ceiling was just lifted and it was heaven. It was heaven. Not that we saw Jesus, it wasn't that, but it was just the glory of God, the glory of God that was so overwhelming. It was so overwhelming, I, as it says beyond words, I cannot express it fully to this day. But I know it was from God. And when I look at that and think of that, guess what? And you may have had experiences in other ways like that yourself. When you were baptized with the Holy Spirit or when he, God showed himself to you and your heart really was just overwhelmed. Let me tell you something. Those times, they're real, but, but, it's just a foretaste. It's just a drop. It's just a deposit. And one day, all will be experienced. All will be received. We can't take it right now because we're in human bodies. We just keel over. We, could, we couldn't make it because we're still limited 
by, by, our, by our human flesh and human nature. But it's a deposit. It's a foretaste. It's a foretaste of how wonderful it will be. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And when God does these things in our lives, it reminds us of what is yet ahead, doesn't it? It helps us to hold on, doesn't it? It helps us to keep on going when times get tough. And he says, a de deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. One day. Jesus will return. It says with a shout, with a trumpet call of God and the voice of the archangel, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and then the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will caught up, be caught up together with them. That's then. And when that is, our inheritance, it is ours. It is ours. It will all be ours. We will, we will receive it all. It will not be snatched from us. We will not, it will not be taken from us. We will not, not be disappointed by it as we have been sometimes been disappointed by other inheritances perhaps that we thought were on the way. You will never be disappointed in what God has for you. This is the work of the Holy Spirit as He is a deposit guaranteeing, guaranteeing our inheritance. This is what he does. And it points to the time when our salvation is fully complete. It's legal. It's legal. But that's not all. It gets even better. This word, guarantee. Now, the word we translate today is deposit. Do any of you love the King James still? You love the King James? I know Keith does. If you read the King James, this says, who is the earnest of our inheritance and that's an old word and it means deposit this word is used in the New Testament only in the Greek only of the Holy Spirit it's not used for anything else okay it's used only of the Holy Spirit and it's in some translations he is the guarantee of our inheritance okay uh, not that one let's leave it here He's the guarantee of our inheritance. It's not just legal, it's something else. If you go to Greece today, this word is still used in this way and it means the same thing. It means an engagement ring. It's an engagement ring which tells us something about God's deposit and the Holy Spirit. His relationship with you is a love relationship. It's a love relationship. Now, some cultures don't do engagement rings very much, do they? Does your culture, American culture, always, almost always does engagement rings? Not so much, right? Not so much. But if you can understand that if your culture did do an engagement ring, it would be the engagement ring is given not from the woman to the man, but from the man to the woman. And what does that engagement ring mean? I love you. That's what it means. I love you. And I'm going to marry you because I love you. That's what it means. We live in a world where people break promises and people break vows. God keeps every promise he makes. Proverbs 30 verse 5. He keeps every promise. And with the Holy Spirit, He guarantees. He's given you an engagement ring. He's, if you want, I, seriously, that's, that's the meaning. He's given you an engagement ring, and He says, I love you, and I'm going to keep my promise to you. I'm going to marry you, if you, want to, if you think about it in that way. And one day there will be. It's, the, it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're the bride of Christ. So that helps us to understand. And it is something he is, he is given by God. And it shows, it's not just legal, brothers and sisters. It's not just, I am a Christian and so now I will go to heaven and not hell. It's a love relationship. And the Holy Spirit does this. He does this in your life. He does this in my life. It's the guarantee He's going to keep his promise. And then we come as we close. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. And this puts it all together. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. How does he anoint us? What is anointing usually with? It's with oil. 
What is the oil the symbol of? The Holy Spirit. He set his seal of ownership on us. What is the seal of ownership? Holy Spirit. And put his spirit in our hearts as what? Deposit. Aha. Here's the word. The engagement ring. The guarantee of what is to come. Oh, thank God for the Holy Spirit that he has given us. Give him his place in your life. This morning, if you have not yet begun this relationship with God, he wants to begin today. He wants to give you his engagement ring. And he wants you to know he loves you. And he's going to keep his promise in your life. Are you struggling this morning and you're worried you're not going to make it? He keeps his promise to you. He keeps his promise to you. His deposit is in you. His deposit is in you. Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for the Holy Spirit of promise, the deposit you have put in our hearts and in our lives that guarantee you're going to fully complete everything in our lives and that our inheritance that is yet ahead. You will bring us into our full inheritance on the day when you come again, when you descend and we hear the trumpet call of God and the voice of the archangel. Hallelujah. But, O oh Lord, until that day, your Holy Spirit keeps us. Work in our lives. Holy Spirit, we don't want to grieve you by the way we live we don't want to grieve you by holding grudges in our hearts against other believers. Holy Spirit, we don't want to grieve you by letting this world be the limit of our horizon, but we want to live as citizens of heaven. Oh, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. And thank you for what you will let yet do in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. Teaching team at 